Hey, welcome everyone. Um, this is the longer version of the Lithia Springs Community Development Training. If you were there at Monday's meeting in February, February 21st, and you've heard the shortened version of this, um, now we're gonna go a little bit more in depth. So strap in, it's gonna be a little longer. I may pause the video, uh, the recording, somewhere in the middle after section three, and then come back to it. So if there's a brief, um, jump, then I've just paused recording and restarted it. I'm going to turn off my screen and without further ado, I just start in the presentation. Okay, so once again, welcome and thank you for attending. We're going to cover the same stuff that we did on Monday. We're going to talk about civic branding and public art first. Then moving on to underutilized uh, spaces and placemaking, improvement incentives, and also funding mechanisms to uh, gain, generate funds for them, streetscapes, and infill development and missing middle housing. Uh, and we'll conclude with some sketches and conceptual examples um, and a map of where you might implement some of these ideas in Lithia Springs, just as a start. Jumping into civic branding and the role of public art. Um, the point I want to get across with civic branding, it's about marketing your community. Um, maybe you don't think about uh, it this way because maybe as uh, public agencies, we don't think of branding as much, but branding is just as important to public agencies and local governments um, as it is to private companies and branding makes uh, you recognizable and it makes you feel like a place uh, lets everyone else know that they're in your place which is lithia springs so the way to do this um, what a lot of communities engage in is signs banners um, art campaigns um, just overall welcoming and letting people know through some kind of symbol or a visual cue or repeated theme that they're in um, your particular space. Welcome signs are pretty common. Uh, this can be on the neighborhood level, like in these pictures uh, here. Virginia Highlands and Kirkwood are neighborhoods in uh, the Atlanta area. And then Brunswick has one for their historic district. And then Roswell, uh, downtown Roswell has sort of combined their map. They have a very active uh, downtown with a lot of things to see and do. So they've uh, created this guide in the form of a map and they've kind of paired that with their um, bespoke designed name, um, Roswell there with the mill and as the O in their lettering. So it's very common to see these kinds of signs in neighborhoods, but cities um, and towns uh, and communities of all sizes also engage in this. They usually place um, these signs at the, so to speak, entrance of their communities where people might first enter. So this is a good idea to implement. Um, could be definitely beneficial in Lithia Springs. On another scale, the scale of the neighborhood and individual homes, there's also campaigns to brand neighborhoods in existence. So this is like neighborhoods adopting a particular symbol or slogan and then having um, property owner buy into, let's say, hang the flag up in a visible place by the front door or somewhere where you can just see it from, from the street. Uh, this gives you know a sense of community. It sort of is is an exercise to to build community. Uh, if you have a historic neighborhood, it's also always worth pointing out. Um, you know that gives that's a, already a good start to um, a reason for implementing this branding. But it could go in any neighborhood, and the design doesn't have to be flashy. Uh, like the hillside neighborhood in Lagrange, their banner is. It's not that complicated, um, but it's it's the same deal as Inman Park, even if it's less known. And then you could also attach these signs to other places, other things in the public realm uh, that are visible. 
like to these street lights um, in Canton, but these signs are actually referring to a neighborhood. So a lot of different options. And lastly, there are these banners. Um, all of these examples, I kept finding it very common in uh, communities across Georgia, uh, neighborhoods, districts, towns, to hang these signs um, or banners off of their lighting. But it doesn't have to be off of lighting. It could be hung off trees, uh, utility poles, and even the sides of buildings. Um, so these are good for, again, serving as welcome signs or showing off that distinct branding design, but also good for um, marketing events. So if you're having special events like in LaGrange or in Hogansville, uh, like the Hummingbird Festival that they have, which I'll talk a little bit about later, these banners are a great way to advertise that in, in the public realm. Uh, where people are going to be walking by or even driving by and able to see that that event is going on. Uh, last, I mean, there's also wayfinding. You uh, you can use, not a, as a banner necessarily, but um, if you do find a need for it, wayfinding is always nice and could be another uh, aesthetic street element to add in your streetscape or in your public realm that uh, is worth considering. Moving on more specifically to art, um, obviously the branding aspect has an art component uh, in, in creating the design and the lettering and all that. But broadly speaking, art can be employed in a number of ways in your place to um, enliven the atmosphere and also to serve as another vehicle for civic branding or telling people something about your community that's unique. Um, it could be anything from murals to sculptures uh, to painted utility boxes and fire hydrants. Murals are very common. With murals, they're sort of a three-tier uh, system or three levels that I like to break it into. One is having no mural and just having the blank wall. And then second, having the mural as a piece of art to make that wall uh, more pleasing, uh, definitely captivating. But lastly, the third level and the best one is when the art is not only captivating, but it's also serving some kind of um, functional or meaningful purpose, like uh, doing double duty as a welcome sign or uh, having the artwork be something um, unique to the community, displaying something unique to the community, either about its history or its people or anything that might be meaningful. These four murals are examples that uh, pull off the third level pretty well uh, and hateful. In the top left, uh, they have this Rise Hapeville mural, which is sort of a slogan and a welcome sign in one. And then, of course, the beautiful artwork behind that. Uh, and there's a lot of a lot of murals in Hapeville. It's a very uh, artistic, culturally active um, community south of Atlanta. Inman Park, you see that uh, black and gold butterfly again. That's featured on their mural because it is their um, branding symbol for the neighborhood. So it's, it's great when that carries over. In Hogansville, they have hummingbirds in their murals. The hummingbird is their symbol there, um, as well as these depictions or vignettes of um, rural life um, that kind of speak to the origins of the community and maybe what its character um, was once upon a time ago or still is in places. And then West End, same deal. Uh, in the letters, you'll see places around Atlanta. So that's sort of speaking to the uniqueness of what's around uh, and what's close to the neighborhood, the West End neighborhood, and also it's a welcome sign to West End. Art in general, um, murals, of course, more murals, um, just as art or maybe calling out something that's not particular to the community, but is a beautiful piece of artwork and has some other meaning. I mean, that's definitely always an option. Um, 
any kind of artwork instead of a, a blank wall could be considered, you know, better. I consider it better, uh, but definitely nice when it could serve both a functional and meaningful purpose and be beautiful at the same time. And then artwork on other uh, things that you see, it could be anywhere. Um, a coat of paint can do wonders. So it could go on staircases, fire hydrants, utility boxes, newspaper, dispensers, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, just to point out two projects here in these examples, on your top uh, right corner is a utility box indicator and they've done this campaign where every utility box near the downtown is designed in a unique way. Uh, it's covered in art, so it's pretty cool. And then in the top left-hand corner, uh, LaGrange has uh, repurposed this blank wall near their downtown and made it into a COVID memorial um, for all the people in their community that have suffered and possibly passed away from the disease. Uh, so that was that's pretty special there and a great use of, well, a great way to commemorate both people that live in the community um, and a great use of space. Sometimes cities and local governments will um, invest in these kinds of art campaigns, uh, like having sculptures. And again, each of these, like the Albany turtles and the Athens bulldogs are painted in a different way. That's not necessarily, uh, you know, something that has to happen, but it's, it's cool to make each one unique in itself. And then the bulldog as, um, as a collection um, is the symbol of Athens. So it's a repeated symbol in sculpture throughout the city. Same with the Albany turtles. And then there are sculptures that aren't uh, repeated. They're not part of a collection, uh, but still improve the streetscape and the public environment. There's this installation in Noonan of that rusty uh, truck, miniature truck. And then LaGrange has done a really cool thing uh, by taking an old millstone from a mill and displaying it downtown with some flowers in front of it and the historic sign uh, that commemorates uh, LaGrange's history as a mill settlement. A great example of a mural project that has been carried out is in Covington. Uh, again, it meets, it checks all those three boxes. Uh, it, it's beautiful and it is a welcome sign and it talks about the history of Covington. So what they've chosen to celebrate here is Covington's relationship with the film industry and uh, scenes of, of scenes from films that have been filmed in Covington and all together melded into this collage that's very beautiful and tells you something about the city, um, what's happened there in the past and also what's really booming there now um, and a way to celebrate what is currently bringing people to Covington a lot of visitors do come to check out uh, the film scene and what's what's been happening there um, in places that have been filmed so it was funded by the downtown tourism and hospitality board and it's painted by a local artist so it's murals are a great way to do just that, engage your local artists. Uh, and it's sort of giving work and economic benefit to the artist while giving a benefit to your place as well. I've been talking about the Hummingbird Festival um, loosely in Hogansville and hummingbirds are a really big deal in Hogansville there carried over into all kinds of methods, like uh, several things that we've talked about so far, including sculptures and artwork and banners, uh, and even these posters that um, advertise the Hummingbird Festival and then the Hummingbird Festival it said, uh, itself. So the Hummingbird is what uh, Hogansville has chosen as a symbol, and they've used it uh, exceptionally well as a marketing tool. Each year, Hogansville hosts the Hummingbird Festival. Uh, the first one was in 1998. It was meant to be a one-time event, but was so successful in raising money that they've continued the tradition. It's raised over $325,000 um, as of now or recently. And all of that money goes to the Hogansville Charitable Trust. It is the chief, the festival is the chief fundraising arm of the Hogansville Charitable Trust. 
uh, which uses the money to make improvements uh, in and around downtown. Uh, anything from building renovations to improvements to the street, um, to acquiring land like uh, a, a park, newly acquired park uh, right next to downtown. And they've made even more of their money by um, applying it towards grants with that receive matching funds from the federal, uh, the federal government or the state or other local grants. So they've been able with their $300,000 roughly to leverage more than $3 million by uh, applying the money to these programs that have matching funds. Uh, if you wanna learn more about it, you can go to hummingbirdfestival.com uh, it will tell you all the history of the festival. They have a really nice video on Hogansville there, which is another great, you know, marketing tool. Um, I mean, there, there's this pretty good, uh, I really like it. It's got drone footage, you know, flying over the city uh, and it's just very well shot. So video promotions, also a branding technique. Here's Hogansville's hummingbirds, uh, the sculptures at least, and then you can see in the middle photo, the banners. Here the hummingbird appears again, and the hummingbird festival itself is right there in that newly acquired park space. That's actually what hosts the hummingbird festival. It's right across from their historic theater. A little bit different. In Powder Springs, they've chosen another type of mascot, a flower at this time. They have a city flower. It's the purple cone flower. And they've used it as a branding a tool um, by landscaping um, buffers uh, near the street or just in lots that are gateways at gateways and also lots that are underused, landscaping them with these purple cone flowers to give a shout out to the city and make the area a little bit more beautiful. And they plan to do um, these installations even more in the future, which I, I was a big fan of this project. I thought it was unique to um, not only landscape, but landscape with meeting, landscape with something unique to your community. We're gonna talk now about placemaking. Um, as it's defined sort of by the project for public spaces uh, and how to implement it to make something more out of underutilized spaces that are all over the place, places in between buildings, um, vacant lots, et cetera. So what is placemaking? Uh, to define it briefly, Placemaking is taking a space and uh, turning it, doing something to it um, and making it into a place. So space to place. I hope I didn't get tongue twisted there. Um, space can be anywhere and a place is somewhere. So some, somewhere where people can point to, uh, maybe that has a name or has a local name. Uh, just somewhere where people can say, oh, I hung out there. I go there. Do you go to that place too? Do you know what I'm talking about? And the answer would be yes. Oh yeah, I love that place. Um, as opposed to sort of a nebulous area. And there's a couple of ways to measure uh, the success of, of these places or just things to think about concepts to consider when thinking about placemaking and where to implement these projects. How much will the space get used? Um, what are the uses? Are there passive and active uses? Is it gonna be comfortable and is it gonna be pleasant to be in? Does it promote socialization? So that's that's pretty important. Um, you wanna create a place you know, where people can gather and us being social animals, social creatures, socialization is really the, the big part of why we do stuff like this in a way. Um, so just looking at it and making it so that people do have access and linkages to these places so that they can go there and socialize and then seeing if people are in fact using your place this way um, are good ways to gauge the success of your project. A successful public space is one that's clean, uh, comfortable, safe, and appealing. 
and where people choose to gather and engage in a variety of activities, passive and active. That's a quote from uh, the Project for Public Spaces, which this is their stick. This is what they do. So if you want to find out more about uh, placemaking and how to measure it and what it is, and also uh, examples of successful projects, including projects in Georgia, uh, pps.org is um, a site that you should definitely check out. To see some ways um, of local examples of how placemaking has happened uh, in other places in Georgia, uh, we'll just take a look at a, a few more slides um, showing case studies. So like I said, a space is anywhere, a place is somewhere. Uh, that's what we're trying to get to when we engage in placemaking. Uh, anything, this, you know, the variety of places that um, our results of placemaking are anything from parks, pocket parks, to plazas, to uh, alleys that have been renovated, uh, renovated vacant lots, and then parts of the street also just a corner, maybe a corner of a street where there are some tables and chairs where people can hang out um, or mingle uh, near a park or in a place where a lot of, there's a lot of foot traffic. That also counts as placemaking. Uh, in this example in LaGrange, um, there used to be a building covering part of this lot, and when it was demolished, the park expanded. So it was always a bit of a mini park, but then it expanded and, and became something even bigger. Uh, it's just a, it's a lawn, and I say it just because it's simple to uh, maintain this, which is great. So all you have to do theoretically, you know, other than the landscaping of the shrubbery and the trees, there and also the shrubs by the uh, still remaining building is you come and mow the lawn and that's pretty easy to maintain in the long term. They also have a few tables uh, with umbrellas for shade and some chairs where people can sit and hang out uh, right there on the corner. And I believe this is a public space. Uh, you, you ideally want your placemaking projects or you know, any type of project where you're creating this sort of uh, community space to be public uh, officially, because that's uh, when people are going to feel welcome. Uh, they're not going to feel like they maybe don't have the right to be in this space. Um, so having this on actually publicly owned property is uh, one of the keys. You know, you want it to be accessible to everybody and you want everybody to feel welcome. And the second key, is to do uh, lighter, quicker, and cheaper uh, projects to get you started. So if you need, you know, if you want to have a kickoff, you don't have to go and say, uh, we're going to demolish a vacant building and uh, put a park in its place, and we're going to landscape it, and we're going to add all these um, street furniture. It could start with something really small. It could be something uh, that's more along the lines of tactical urbanism, like um, doing a uh, a layer of paint somewhere on a vacant parking lot, um, installing a basketball hoop somewhere in a vacant parking lot, or just doing minimal plantings and mowing the grass and putting some dip chairs out there that are really cheap and seeing what happens. Uh, starting there is just going to help gain momentum for bigger projects in the future. Here's a pocket park uh, in Smyrna as an example. This is across from Town Village, but it's not actually a part of Town Village. It's, it serves as a neighborhood pocket park. So this is an awkward lot. It's uh, small and awkwardly shaped from a developer's perspective. It doesn't necessarily meet the standards of, where, of um, what is needed to build a conventional building. Maybe a developer would like more space or maybe the zoning just doesn't allow uh, building certain types of building on buildings on uh, that size lot. There's all kinds of reasons why it might not be developed, but the fact is it's likely not to be developed. So the the community has chosen to invest in a public park instead. And they've done this landscaping and benches and this um, free library and the awning just to make it a more inviting space, a clean uh, manicured space to come and hang out or maybe even have meetings or neighborhood events. One of my favorite examples is of a place where I grew up going to. Um, 
this is behind that place. Um, it's behind a coffee shop in downtown Marietta, Marietta Square. The coffee shop is called Cool Beans. It's been busy for as long as I can remember. And I grew I went to high school around uh, Marietta. So this is the coffee shop that I went to. And it's always been packed. And they've had this patio space also for as long as I can remember, even though I think it was built um, a little bit later. The thing is, though, it's not their patio space. It's actually public space um, right off this alley that cuts between the block and um, in between these buildings. So this is this is great. It's actually publicly owned space and anyone can come here and it's very nice. Usually people from the coffee shop end up here because the coffee shop is so busy and it's a great place to come um, and have your drink. But also there's a local dance studio and of course all the other businesses downtown um, and people like parents waiting for their kids to finish dance will come and sit here and people just walking around will come through the alley and sit and rest. Um, it's really beautiful what they've done with it. They installed the pavers, the lights, the trees, uh, and the street furniture. Similarly, there's an example in Hogansville, right by another coffee shop, funny enough, um, called Station Coffee, which is in a repurposed uh, train station building. Right outside that, in between the coffee shop and the next building, they've done a similar thing where they've added pavers and made this really, really nice place. Like, it, it just looks beautiful. And it's, it's a nice place to just go and also to have you drink. Um, and it's unique how you get there, too. It has a lot of different approaches. But anyway, so it's, it's a, a creative use of this, like, in-between space, in-between buildings that's hard to reach and people might not notice. But then they end up walking by and it's sort of like, wow, that's a beautiful place. I want to be there. That's the goal of this uh, placemaking um, exercise. And then in LaGrange uh, also, uh, there's this plaza. So just to show an example of what a hardscape looks like. Um, hardscape is just like a park, but you know, it's not turf and it's not grass. It's uh, paved or it has these pavers. Uh, I'm not sure if the Overlook Plaza is actually public in LaGrange, but it is semi-public, um, meaning that you know you you feel like you can walk in there. It might actually own uh, be under the ownership of one of the local businesses, though. So it has a lot of seating. It has this amphitheater, great place for events. One thing is that it's not very shady in the summer, but Overall, it's it's just a great place, just great asset for the uh, city to have to host events. Then there are places in between buildings that don't get used as much, but still, it's um, it's worth the time, uh, you know, to landscape them or to make them slightly better than they were before. And these are places that people see that do matter to businesses, and they. They definitely matter to locals. Um, and what LaGrange and Hogan's have both done are these projects to renovate these spaces in between their buildings. Uh, in Hogan'sville, it's the middle photos. It's simply those planters, um, a little bit of a mural, some trees there in the alley and the path, which make it nicer. And there's, there's also a bench. Um, there's just a nice walkthrough. Uh, you could park your car, I think, behind the buildings then use this path to get onto the downtown Main Street or vice versa. In LaGrange, they have a lot of these places where you can walk around in between buildings and sort of an interconnected uh, path uh, or system between these sorts of spaces, uh, their sidewalks, some plazas, and um, a little bit of pocket parks that they have downtown. And they've made them look really nice. Uh, workers can come out here and take breaks. I enjoyed walking through them, certainly. And if, if, if there are locals there, they might know about them and, and end up walking through them as well. They're pretty big and LaGrange has made them noticeable. They haven't treated them as sort of uh, residual spaces where maybe it's just dumpsters in the back um, and utilities and, you know, places to park or something. They've taken the time to uh, improve them. More specifically about alleys, uh, renovating alleys is a, is a hot thing right now. Um, if you have alleys, this is something that um, is definitely um, interesting to consider. 
uh, very beautiful projects in some places like in Chattanooga, it has a few alleys. <clears throat> this is one of them. Um, this is one where they've outfitted it with a bunch of different colorful umbrellas and hanging lights. So it's also beautiful at night. Uh, that's a little bit of a bigger reach than some of these other places uh, that I'll give as examples. Powder Springs has done an alley, uh, similar but not as high budget. Uh, they have the lights uh, on top, and they also are going to use this space as an outdoor art, art gallery. So I imagine the art will be uh, rotating soon, but I think the, the alley was recently renovated, so I don't know if they've rotated the art yet. And they've got that landscaping and that nice paving uh, to make the place inviting. Statesboro did um, a nice project with an even smaller alley that I'll talk about a little bit more in depth because it's a cool story. So this is an alley somewhere downtown and you can see the before picture. Um, it was just where the businesses uh, stored their dumpsters and then random objects like um, traffic cones and there's that one chair there so maybe someone was coming out here and taking a break already and then uh, versus the renovation they added chairs they added that um, uh, trellis for uh, climbing plants and some uh, murals in the back that mural is of a place in Italy I think it's it's a place in this in Statesboro's sister city um, it might be Moreno Italy uh, I'm not sure, but it's the sister city of Statesboro in Italy, and uh, it's sort of even is a really neat artistic concept because it sort of expands the space and makes it look even bigger. Uh, you know, you you walk in, you see the alley, and then you have this um, mural of the alley's extension in a sense. So it makes the space feel a little bit bigger. So that was a really creative, uh, interesting idea. Uh, the final product actually looks. Uh, remarkably close to um, the conceptual sketch from what I'd expect. Sometimes those things are not at all similar, but this one ended up looking kind of like the sketch. The neat story behind this project is that um, the grant was passed over, so it was applied for by the Everett Center for the Arts. Uh, they applied for a vibrant communities grant that's awarded by the Georgia Council for the Arts. And then they won that grant and then they passed it on uh, to the downtown Statesboro Development Authority, which took on the project and uh, actually was in charge of uh, building and construction. So it's neat, it's sort of a partnership situation that happened here. On a different level, there's a nonprofit organization in Brunswick called Signature Squares of Brunswick. And they're all about renovating the uh, historic uh, squares um, interspersed uh, among the city uh, that have been neglected over time. Not much had been done with them and they've gone back and re-landscaped them, repaved, uh, made them into parks. You can see in the middle top picture, it's it's not much of a square, it's sort of looking more like a vacant lot um, beforehand and then after renovation, it's a true um, public space in its own right. Uh, where, And it's, it's big, it's ample. Um, in their case, they had the um, opportunity to, to use this big, make use of a bigger space because the city was planned that way. These public um, spaces were embedded within the city structure itself. And that's just a virtue of, of their history and their town planning from the beginning. But um, they had been neglected, though, for all these years. And someone came along and fixed them up. Um, it started with one project, like the Hogansville Hummingbird Festival. Uh, the first time happened, and then it was such a big success that they kept going and doing it over and over again. So they've done a few of these renovations now, and I don't know how many exactly. But the first one was in 2006 and it received half uh, matching funds from the city. Now I don't think they receive any matching funds. A lot of the work is done by volunteers, but they're still able, building upon that first success, to continue renovating more and more squares in Brunswick. All right. And I want to pause it just for a second. Give me one moment and we'll be right back.
Okay, uh, let's get back to it. Okay, um, so we have three more sections plus a little bit of an addendum to go. Um, the last two are shorter, so we can go through them relatively quickly. Uh, we'll try to finish up in the next 30 to 45 minutes. If it starts getting really long on a certain section, then I'll take another uh, small pause and then come back to it and finish up. So next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, community improvement incentives and funding mechanisms. So programs that um, allow you, uh, your local government to generate money uh, to make some of uh, these improvements that we've talked about previously or others happen uh, and also to incentivize business owners and uh, residential property owners to make improvements as well. So just, we've already had uh, the brief summary um, of what I just said. Um, that's what we're talking about when, when I say financial mechanisms. To break it down a little bit further, there's a couple of tax-based ones in Georgia, like TADS, SPLOS, Special Tax Districts, Community Improvement Districts that are all uh, enabled by Georgia legislation to be formed to raise funds. So that's one option. And then there's also, of course, other funding mechanisms um, or banks that you can reach into uh, and pull out of as a local government um, that you may use for grants or to establish a revolving loan fund. Or of course, you can issue bonds to generate funds as well. And we won't talk much uh, as much about that, uh, but we'll talk about the uh, tax-based uh, funding mechanisms. And also we're gonna talk about facade improvement programs and a little bit about code enforcement too. So starting with facade improvement programs, this is about um, commercial properties and making improvements to the facade or the front of the building. Sometimes it's just a matter of applying a new coat of paint. Other times um, the facade renovation is more in depth and is like a full facelift of the property. But what this does um, is increase property values. It makes for uh, a nicer, more updated, place um, for your public to visit and it gives property owners you know a larger sense of pride in their um, in their ownership and in their business it's something that property owners might not be able to do or invest in on their own so having these types of programs can help incentivize um, that change to happen more quickly Usually these programs are funded through grants or loans given to the commercial property owner, but oftentimes also reimbursements, meaning that um, the property owner will uh, invest um, the upfront costs of making the renovation and then the city or local government or other administrative authority will then pay back the um, property owner for those improvements. And the downside to this, there is one downside is that, like I said, um, some property owners will, might not have the capital, all of the capital to really uh, pay for this upfront by themselves. So the re that's one downside of the reimbursement as opposed to an upfront grant or loan, but either way is viable um, within this framework. And also usually, um, of course, the owner has to provide some sort of uh, matching fund uh, at different levels. Uh, some, sometimes it's rather low, sometimes it's more substantial fee uh, or a more substantial portion of what the uh, grant would be. Here are some facade improvements. I think from the city of Philadelphia, I pulled these examples. Uh, just because they had uh, before and after pictures um, that were really good to use. So this is what a facade improvement to a commercial property looks like. And then the Bell Line has also uh, started up a program here for uh, properties that are in the Bell Line Tax Allocation District. Um, they had their pilot in 2019. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about um, this case study 
but they did two properties in 2019 and I'm not sure if they continued because of COVID uh, the next two years, but I'm hoping that it um, restarts, you know, uh, soon. That's what I expect too. And then residential uh, facade improvements. Sometimes facade improvement programs can be targeting residential properties, but they're less common than the ones that are targeting commercial properties. And just to briefly mention, the middle photo is actually uh, something that arose out of uh, code enforcement practices uh, rather than a residential facade improvement program, but the effect is similar. So a little bit more about the Beltline program. Um, started in 2019, it's funded by the Atlanta Beltline. It gives up to $40,000 to commercial property owners. They're required to match 5% of that. And I think the best part about this program is that it matches a local artist with a property owner. So again, it's doing that twofold benefit, one to the arts community, and then secondly to the business community. And then lastly, of course, overall, the big effect is that it's better for the neighborhood and uh, the whole district. There could be small projects, like in this case, it's a coat of paint uh, and having different paint between the trim and the rest of the wall, which makes the building look nice. Um, and then having those bicycle tires and spoke design, or it could be something bigger, like the other example that was in a, a few slides ago, I think three slides back was Reed's Beer Garden. That's the other project that was in the pilot program. And they installed like this neon light installation on, on the top of the facade, which looks really beautiful, but that's also a heavier lift. Pivoting now to code enforcement. Um, code enforcement is something that um, can be implemented by any community and is implemented on a day-to-day -day basis, but some uh, places um, enforce it if more holistically, more effectively than others, I would say. Um, and it's ubiquitous in the sense that it's it's always every place has a building code on the books um, or a residential standards code, but it's not always enforced um, to the highest degree. And it doesn't always need to be, but sometimes it's it's good to take a second look at it and see where um, that process can be bettered or done more intensely. So Gainesville's done a really good job of this. Um, I really like their story and I think it's one that should be shared um, across Georgia and other communities and what they did was they recognized they had a code enforcement problem that they wanted to ameliorate um, but they didn't know how to do that so first they were a part of GIC the Georgia Initiative for Community Housing uh, from the a program run by the Georgia Municipal Association and they asked other communities, you know, how they went about it. And after they got that feedback, they came back to Gainesville and did a few things. First, they took their elected officials um, and other um, city administrators um, on a bus tour to actually see the communities and the neighborhoods that they wanted to uh, more um, have a hyper focus uh, in their code enforcement practices on. And some of these communities had been um, already distressed from, from a long time ago, and but nothing had been done about them effectively. So what was the game changer is actually bringing those people to those neighborhoods so they can see for themselves, the elected officials and the administrators, what they were dealing with and why this was a problem uh, and then start to think about how it could be fixed. And the other key uh, to the success of this program is that um, the code enforcement officials and the planning uh, directors had full communication with the landowners, tenants, and um, the elected officials and the, the city attorney the whole time. So the key was communication, um, keeping everyone aware of what was happening, uh, keeping everyone aware of the expectations, especially, you know, landlords who uh, needed to be brought up to standard or uh, 
in the case where landlords were having to make repairs, tenants that might be dis displaced, the um, the planning directors or the planning department and the code enforcement officials worked with any tenants that need to be this that needed to be displaced because of renovations on finding new uh, housing or temporary housing for the time being. And actually, most of these cases in uh, in their first neighborhood, for example, that they went to, they had uh, they have like seven areas or nine areas, sorry, that they need to um, to target over a couple of years. And they started, and I think they've done five out of nine so far, but the first one they went to, 75% of the properties that were in violation were owned by um, a group of people that were uh, connected, uh, either relatives or friends um, that were landlords that had that weren't brought into compliance, um, or they had been not really renovating their buildings uh, for a long time. And there was, uh, I think, a threat to you know have some backlash. Uh, from those owners, you know, to challenge the uh, local government in um, making them come into compliance with uh, code regulations, but the city stuck to their guns, and because they had this good relationship with the city attorney and the support from the elected officials, they were able to defuse the challenge, and actually um, the relationship between the property owners and the city ended up being good, and a lot of properties um, came into better condition because of that. And a lot of times it was the landlords and not, not the the tenants. Um, more more often than not. Now we're moving on to those tax based programs that are uh, possible in Georgia, uh, that I mentioned at the start of this section. First being special tax tax districts. Uh, what these are are um, special districts that are uh, set aside uh, where people in that district elect to uh, levy a tax on themselves for specific improvements. Um, a lot of times around infrastructure like road, sewer, or water improvements. And there's a, a couple of examples across the state of how this is played out. So in Macon, there is uh, a road improvement district, or you can a found one, you could establish a road improvement district. And the way this happens is any property owner fronting uh, a private street, I think this is for private streets, uh, I believe, they could start a petition for creating this district. And as long as they get 85% buy-in within the proposed district, then it's presented to the Board of Commissioners. The Board of Commissioners can advance the resolution and establish this district. And this is a way for people um, people that live on private roads, uh, mainly where those roads now don't have a support system to be um, to be repaved or maintained. And there's no way to kind of gain those funds other than to uh, collaborate together. They, those property owners on that private street collectively decide that they want to levy a tax on themselves to make those improvements possible. So that's one example. In Oconee County, there are a couple of types of uh, special tax, tax districts that they allow uh, to be created. One is a water and sewer. Another one is road and drainage improvement tax districts, and they even have a street light tax district. Here, the process is uh, a little different. Um, each one of these different districts has their own uh, appropriate authority that you reach out to, to establish one or consider, begin the process of considering to establish a district. Then that official sort of determines the feasibility uh, and assesses whether that district is actually viable. Then the, at the same time, there's the same petition process, except this time it's a two thirds agreement rather than 85%. And that's on the, uh, the property owner petitioning for the uh, district. Uh, they have to gather the signatures to show the support for this district. And then once the feasibility has been determined and it's, it's a go ahead and the agreement is there from the property owners, then it moves uh, into local government, into the Board of Commissioners, and uh, it's established as a district. So again, this is an additional tax levied by property owners to support a specific purpose like water and sewer, roads and drainage, 
uh, in street lights, street lights uh, districts. That's what we're talking about when we're uh, talking about special tax districts is targeting those specific improvements. Something that's similar as a, but, but also very different tax allocation districts. Um, I say similar because it is, uh, it's tax uh, associated, tax related, but the way that the funds are generated is a little bit differently. Uh, TADs don't actually levy a new tax uh, on, on property or on owners. They just set aside the uh, increase in property taxes in the future to a specific uh, purpose. So there is a floor, let's say, of the property taxes generated right now in the district. And then a TAD is established. And then it's said that, okay, well, above that floor, any new property tax revenue generated for a specific period of time uh, will be used uh, towards these specific uh, goals, right? So uh, sometimes that plays out like this. Um, the floor is set, the tax district is established, then the local government will sell bonds to generate funds to make improvements already, you know, before that additional tax income is there. But then the property improvements are made, the property taxes go, go up, uh, that revenue has been set aside for funding those improvements. So the bonds are paid back with the uh, money generated from the TAD. And one big example of a TAD uh, in use is Atlantic Station in Atlanta. So this was built on a brownfield and part of it was in the building of it, construction was made possible through uh, designating a TAD. And Douglas County has had a TAD. So you guys are familiar with this type of process. And the other one you're probably familiar with is SPLOST uh, funding. SPLOST is an optional 1% on uh, sales tax levied in our, in our region, our district, for um, usually public service improvements. Uh, it's been used for uh, new fire stations, uh, police funding. Um, I have an example where it's been used um, to, to make improvements to a museum or part of it. So this is uh, established for a certain period of time, five to six years, so a little bit um, shorter. Uh, and it's a 1% sales tax, so it's, it doesn't have to do with property tax. This is a sales tax in this case. The Cab County is really good about publicizing their successes with the SPLOSS program. So I would check out their site uh, to see the many different ways in which they've used SPLOSS. And here's that example uh, taken just from Google Street View. Uh, I was there in Athens, but I didn't snap a, a good picture uh, from this. So I decided to go back and check it out. But I thought it was really neat because um, they have a similar thing where they're advertising their success with SPLOST. But in this case, the SPLOST funds was used, were used to um, make improvements to this garden or to update the garden in a, a historic museum. And then there's this program called eHost, Equalized Homestead Option Sales Tax, which I've only found an example of in DeKalb County so far. But what it is, is a way to um, provide an offset to property taxes for uh, property owners that are under homestead exemption. So this is a help uh, to homeowners in paying their property taxes. Um, so it's again, voluntary. Uh, or it's a tax district that's established by the county um, and its revenue specifically goes towards offsetting property taxes. It uh, replaced the previous uh, program that they had in place, which was just called HOST, Homestead Option Sales Tax, because uh, the update there is that 20% of the funds from the previous program could go to public infrastructure and facility projects. So instead, they updated it into the eHOST um, program where 100% of the funds now go to property tax offsets. The legislation that makes this uh, possible, I believe, uh, in Georgia is the Equalized Homestead Option Sales Tax Act of 2015. So there's a enabling legislation on that. And I believe lastly, uh, the Community Improvement Districts, another form of tax district 
where uh, this one is local business owners, usually commercial properties uh, and, and their owners um, agreeing to, to levy a tax on themselves for improvements in, in the district. And examples of these, um, they're more common in Atlanta, but there's um, Midtown Alliance. Uh, I believe they administer the Midtown CID. Uh, so their money goes towards uh, improving uh, the streetscape and just sort of the overall environment in, in Midtown Atlanta in order to then generate more, um, you know, sales and, and property taxes uh, from new assessments um, after these improvements and thereby making, in the long run, making the uh, district more successful by making these investments. So the tax, the additional tax pays itself off is, is what I'm trying to say. And then there's one in downtown Atlanta too, another CID, which has funded their uh, own public security force. I've been using the word streetscapes a lot throughout this presentation. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means specifically in this next section. So the streetscape is everything uh, in the street that is including the sidewalk, everything in the right of way. So it's the travel lanes uh, and then the sidewalk and all that public territory, all of it together and any plantings and features that are within that. So making uh, improvements to the streetscape might mean um, new crosswalks, wider sidewalks, planting trees, decorations, uh, traffic safety improvements, traffic calming, you know, any of these things would fall under uh, street streetscape improvements. We'll quickly go through some examples of what that looks like. This photo is from Powder Springs. So what makes their streetscape so pleasant are some of the features that I'm going to outline here. The planters, uh, the, the buffer, probably two foot buffer of grass, um, which a lot of places have. They have those special pavers on the sidewalk and they even have the pots in front of the businesses uh, as well. Um, all of the things um, that we talked about or most of the things that we've been talking about, you know, and, and civic branding and so on, they go in the streetscape environment. So your right of way is really, really important. And it's um, it should be treated as your, your chief public space, your um, most important public asset uh, are your streets. So improving them and making them hospitable for all kinds of uh, foot traffic or all kinds of traffic, sorry, um, foot traffic and cars and and bikes and everything is, is really, really important. And especially the pedestrians so you can get people out in your community. Downtown LaGrange has a really nice um, street environment. Um, they have some different features from the Powder Springs photo that I can point out here. Uh, street trees are very important. Theirs are a lot older. Um, they have this kind of historic uh, lighting, uh, light posts there that are um, similar throughout their downtown. I really like this traffic calming technique that they've used. So they have this bulb out into the middle of the street, which makes the crossing for pedestrians a lot shorter at that point. So it's a pinch point. And that's that's a lot more encouraging to a pedestrian than having to cross um, several lanes of traffic. Midtown, a little further out of the box, uh, out of scale, but also they've invested uh, a lot in their streetscape. Some of that money through, I'm sure, has come from the funds generated from the CID. Uh, they have everything from bike racks to special pavers, uh, parallel parking, really generous sidewalks, uh, 10 to 15 feet, I think, in their case, and, and big planting strips um, for those trees. So four or five, four or five or six feet for a planting strip. And an element that I haven't mentioned so far uh, outside of the streetscape, uh, bus shelters. So when you're thinking about implementing um, more bus routes or making improvements along the street to your existing bus routes, taking the time to think about um, 
your bus shelter is definitely important. Uh, not not complicated, not rocket science, but still very helpful to have a, a, a place, a shelter that protects someone from the elements, protects someone from um, extreme temperatures like hot or cold. And it's just a nice place uh, to wait uh, for the bus rather than having no shelter at all. Certainly preferable to have something, you know, covering it. And the last topic that I'll hit on another brief section is missing middle housing and infill development. Something that's great for Lithia Springs, places like Lithia Springs is uh, exactly this type of development, which we're, I'm, I'm calling infill development, we call infill development, and that's a differentiated from, let's say, greenfield development that takes uh, a brand new site, usually a big site, you know, and develops uh, a lot on it, like several homes, a uh, whole subdivision or uh, big buildings and so on. The infill development is different because it's taking sort of uh, land uh, or available opportunities within the existing developed territory and building those up. So it's more incremental. It's like filling in the gaps uh, rather than investing in this huge chunk of land and doing something really big one time. And missing middle housing is a subset that usually happens through infill development. Um, that's just the way it's it's happened historically, but it's not necessarily related. Like you could build missing middle housing on a, a greenfield or whatever, but uh, missing middle housing itself is that range of homes between a single family home and those um, larger mid-rise apartments. It includes a lot of things that historically we used to build all the time, but now we don't build uh, nearly as often and sometimes it's even prohibited to build these types of buildings. There's a lot of examples still in existence though of non-conforming uses that are left over in communities everywhere of this type of building. So it'd be great to see um, this type of building of this whole range from duplex to uh, triplexes and live work. Um, construction to be revitalized and to be as robust as it was in the past. And it's it's great to partner with Info Development. To show you examples of um, missing middle now a little bit, uh, one style is this uh, cottage court structure. Uh, this one's very palatable to um, a lot of communities and it's very nice. Um, it's, it's like single family homes, but the homes are just sometimes not, they're not even smaller, but usually they're a little bit on the smaller side, definitely not tiny homes or anything, but it's, a, it's more single family homes built around a shared space. So it's much more land efficient. Uh, the homes are smaller, they're arranged in a different way. You don't have as big of a backyard, but it looks exactly like a single family home and it fits into existing single family neighborhoods perfectly. Uh, and the other big draw for people and living in these kinds of communities, they're attracted to them because of that shared communal space. Um, so it's a very neighborly environment if pulled off correctly. And these are all over the place. Um, there's one in Trillith, in the Trillith development in Fayetteville. Um, there's one in Clarkston outside of Atlanta. So this is one of our collaborators projects, actually, MicroLife Institute. Uh, check them out. Definitely, they're uh, experts in building these kinds of cottage courts, the cottage court development developments, and also advocating for them. Uh, and there's also one in Brunswick that we like to use as an example too. Here's the full cottages on Vaughn by MicroLife Institute. Again, these are our partners. Please check them out if you have time. Uh, they've done a really, really great job with this and they helped also with writing the uh, legislation for the Cab County to allow these types of developments. Then moving from cottage courts, there's also these uh, multiple unit homes, you know, from duplexes to, to more units, uh, more than two units, but Duplexes uh, historically were very common and there's a lot of old ones on the right hand side it's a duplex in Porterdale. I don't know how old it is, but it's certainly renovated. It looks really nice. And recently I found some examples of new duplexes being uh, put up. I know this photo may not be uh, from LaGrange, um, 
which is where this is one location that I'm not sure where this photo came from on the left hand side. But I do know that in LaGrange, I have uh, examples of new duplexes being put up there. And there are some, there's some examples of that kind of development happening still to this day, which is very cool to see. And then on the uh, side of, you know, existing non-conforming uses where um, this, develop, this type of development isn't as common today for sure, uh, but it exists by virtue of um, buildings that have uh, been carried over from the past that were used in this way and are now non-conforming uses. That's those larger like multiplex uh, buildings from four to eight units or maybe even 12 units. Um, and they look like single family or they fit really well in single family homes. They look like single family homes. They're just bigger, larger, larger proportions, but they actually house um, you know, so many more households. Uh, you can have four households in, in something that looks like, uh, from the street view, it just looks like another single family home in the single family neighborhood. So these are um, great ways to up uh, density, provide more places for people to live, provide them at different price points within existing neighborhoods without disrupting that character or leaving anything worse for wear. Here's some more examples that I just found this weekend um, where I live. I live in Avondale Estates and I was just walking across the street and I saw this new, newish du duplex. I don't know how new it is, um, but there was a duplex in this neighborhood. And then on the same street, just a little bit down the road, I found this small apartment building. So really cute buildings, really nice, um, desirable for a lot of people um, to live in and have as homes, but just not built as frequently, um, just because of the way our practice and the building practice has come to evolve. And a lot of times, again, our regulations not allowing this kind of building. That's it. That wraps it up for the uh, topics that we're going to cover. Uh, I'll just leave you with um, a few resources for Lithia Springs that you might use uh, into the future as you begin to decide um, on your next action steps and where uh, some of the lessons that we've talked about can be implemented. First, uh, here's this map, um, just as a starter, marking some places where this these sort of themes fall. Uh, that's that being civic branding, using metal, placemaking, um, facade improvements. Just a quick little basic map um, of ideas for where to implement these things. And I won't read through them, but please feel free to take a look at it on your own time. This presentation is provided to you. Uh, and use it as a starter. Uh, you guys know Lithia Springs a lot better than I do. I've been there a handful of times, but you actually live there. So this is just uh, an initial idea list um, that should be uh, you know, built onto. And I'm sure that there are people in the community that have a lot more ideas of places where to implement this kind of stuff uh, than I do. And some sketches of, of what could be done and what this might look like if you apply these lessons to particular places um, or objects and important symbols in your community. One is the clock, of course, uh, the Lithia Springs clock now on the left, and then you could repaint it. You could not repaint it and add a sign next to it. Um, that will be your gateway signage also. Or you can take it a step further and add the gateway sign and do landscaping. So it just looks nice and noticeable uh, throughout the year for everybody. Taking some shots from downtown and reimagining what they might look like. Here's an example um, next to that. This commercial node between you know where Sweetwater Road intersects uh, Veteran Memorials, uh, Veterans Memorial Highway. Uh, this is sort of like the the downtown area, and it's really where you might you know in in years, if with enough um, attention given to it, this could be a really uh, community center uh, more than it is now. And this is just a sketch reimagining it as. What if you took away the street parking that's in front of the businesses and used it as a sidewalk instead? What if you planted trees? What if you used that blank wall as a mural and then did those facade improvements um, 
to the local businesses and just try to attract more people and um, get that life flowing again in that place. Very similar uh, location just around the corner, but again, uh, imagining what that would look like with those facade improvements, a little uh, residual space uh, attention, making that alley or in between space into something, and then doing uh, the sidewalk and the planters and all that stuff. That's what I'll leave you with. Um, thank you very much for listening to this full presentation. And thank you so much for being there on Monday. Uh, my colleague is Nick Johnson. I am Lubin Rachev. Feel free to reach out to us through these contact emails at any time. And I look forward to working with you again soon. Thank you so much.